You are watching Tips 806, which is part four of a four-part series. It would benefit you greatly if you saw all four of these videos as a series. I will put the links in the description. Welcome back to the shop. As you know, in the past three videos, and this is the final one of the series, I have been converting a South Bend 9-inch Model C into a B by switching the aprons. So this is the old apron from a C, and this is the apron that both an A and a B would use. They are identical. But in order to make the transition, I had to do several things, and one of them was I had to make a gear to fit the crossfeed screw, and that's a dedicated video that you need to watch. And then in the last video, I cut the keyway into the lead screw. Lead screws on Model C's do not have a keyway, so it is necessary. So let's begin now by reassembling and fitting and showing you how all this works and then testing the machine to make sure it works. And I hope it does. I've spent a whole week on this. So let's begin. Well, there was quite a burr on the lead screw after I cut the key away, but the key, a key, fits just perfectly and I want a slide fit. I do not want it to hang up at any given point. You'll see why in a minute. Now to get those burrs off, I did gently file this while it was revolving in the closing lathe downstairs. And then I took a file and ran it like this on both sides here trying to get rid of the burr. And I did, but it, it was time consuming. But I'm very pleased with the way that turned out. As I told you in some of the other video parts, the Model C apron is greatly simplified to keep the price down. It was an entry level machine, so we're moving it up a notch to the Model B. And you can see again how much more complicated this is. But the lead screw is really serving two purposes here. It, it's used for threading in conjunction with the split nut where the actual thread is used but for the cross feed and longitudinal feed the power is delivered again by the lead screw but when it enters the worm here there's a key and as it revolves which I'll show you in a second here the feeds will operate now on larger lathes such as the one that for instance uh, Adam Booth has they have a very large apron and they usually have a feed rod. They have a lead screw used only for threading and then the feed rod which does the other things here that I'm talking about. And that greatly increases the expense as well and the size. Let's run through this real quickly before I mount this on the lathe. This is the feed change lever. The top position is for longitudinal feed, the middle position is for threading, and the bottom position is for the cross feed. Let me demonstrate. Again, the feed change lever is in the top position for longitudinal feed and the clutch is engaged. Now watch as I rotate this aluminum bar. This of course is the clutch and this gear engages with the rack and the apron would now be moving in the longitudinal direction that is left to right and of course it could be reversed on the lathe using the feed reverse lever. Okay now I have shifted the feed change lever to the bottom position so that we will have cross feed and when that happens which you'll see in a second the, this gear will revolve and it will mesh with the gear that's on the crossfeed screw and that will move the crossfeed either in and out depending on the position of the feed reverse lever to the left of your lathe. So watch now. Again the clutch is engaged. In review now, and I know I repeat myself because I don't know if everybody has watched every video, but inside the worm here there is a key. Now I want to show you how well the lead screw with its new keyway fits into that.
so we have a nice sliding fit. All right, another thing to show you before we put this together. Okay, I had temporarily removed this guard, and it serves two purposes. It keeps chips out of the worm and the clutch pack. And uh, secondly, this is an oil reservoir, and there's a Gitz oiler on the underside here, which you'll see later, and a plug here, because you're supposed to drain this regularly, and always keep this topped off. But before this can be put on, I have to make either make a gasket or use some kind of sealant because otherwise the oil would come out of there. There was no gasket on there, but it looks like at one time somebody possibly had silicone on there. Let me show you the parts book. Here's the parts exploded view, and you can see there's a little gasket there, number 53. I do not have one of those. I'm not in the mood for making one. I am going to use Permatex number two, form a gasket, pliable, non-hardening. Do not get this on your fingers. The only way is to remove it is to be cremated. I'm going to put that on because it's messy off camera. You don't need to see that. And there's four screws attaching this. Now I plead with you, I beg with you, do not clean your machines with compressed air because it blasts the chips up into here. There should be no chips in here. They really have no way of getting in there because of gravity, but compressed air will blast them up there, in there, and also in the bottom of your quick change gearbox if you have one. And the chips do tremendous damage. Okay, they're all four tightened, and I still managed to make a mess, which I think when I grab it will get even worse, and I got a little on my thumb. Luckily, I already have my cremation scheduled, and I'll put the plug in here as well, and let's step over to the actual machine. But wait, one more thing to show you. On this side, this is the Gitz oiler right here that fills that reservoir. What I didn't show you in an earlier video is I had to remove the banjo here in order to get the lead screw all the way out. I'm not quite ready to put that on and these two screws that hold it on right here were incredibly tight and there was interference here so I did use my impact screwdriver with an extension on it and it worked great and I will use that to re-tighten them because we do not want those to come loose. But the first thing I will do now is to reinstall the bearing on the other end. This is real easy to take on and off. And I will tighten these off camera with that impact. Or I sometimes, I like this square shank screwdriver because I can put a crescent wrench on here and get it pretty darn tight. Those are Philister head screws that I prefer a cap screw, but they didn't seem to use those much years ago. Make sure all parts are surgically cleaned before you assemble them and lightly oiled. I won't show that. Everything is clean. This machine was quite clean when I got it from John. And by the way, this is called the saddle. It rides back and forth on the bed and on the ways. Matter of fact, it rides the bed kind of like a cowboy. Oh, excuse me, cow person. Then, this cross-feed screw simply goes in like this. But before I install these parts here, let me get a rear view here and show you uh, something I had to deal with, and that's a week ago. Okay, I'm back on the back side of the machine now. And again, this gear here was too large to fit through this hole. That hole was approximately a sixteenth or less too small. It's probably a cord hole. Anyway, I opened it up by taking my step Christmas tree bit, putting it on an extension, and that just worked great. It, it didn't take much. I did not have a twist drill long enough to reach in there of the right size. Let me know in the comments if I am giving you too much information. Would you rather have it sped up? Okay, now the little graduated collar goes on. This piece is already tightened with that homemade spanner wrench. 
So on this goes, and then the ball crank. Now remember there's a tiny little round key that must line up with this keyway. Like that, and I'll tap it in place, and this nut will draw it in. And remember, I have a special screwdriver for that that I made. And after that's tightened, this should still turn freely, and there shouldn't be any backlash or play, or minimal, I should say. And that turns just nice. There's no noise with the gear. So that's all done. No, it's not. One more thing. Do not forget to put this little plunger in there. And this one's made of aluminum. Some of them are brass. If you lose it, aluminum or brass is fine. And this is 5 30 seconds. And that keeps the set screw from damaging the, the piece underneath it and putting a burr on it. So I'll put that back in now, which is a bit of a struggle. And of course, the purpose of this little screw is to allow you to zero out your graduated dial if necessary and then retighten it. It would be handier if it was a thumb screw, but then it's always in your way, so it's kind of a toss up. Now I'm ready to put the apron into place up here, and there are two Philister head screws. And two things you have to watch out for. One is that as you bring it up and engage it, this gear here has to mesh with the little gear on the crossfade screw. And then the other thing is the lock right here, the carriage lock, is somewhat tricky to install because you have to get it in there just right. And I won't really be able to show you that because by experience I know that I will struggle like a son of a gun doing that. But before I put it together, I'm going to put a little oil, and this is 20 weight, which I got at Napka, Napa, on all of the gears, and it will distribute itself a little bit as you rotate it. Okay, up into position. I know I won't get it the first time, so excuse me if the air turns blue. You see what I mean? Be right back. Okay, I've got both screws started, and as you do that and draw this up, it's, the apron is not drawn up into the saddle yet. Feel your hand wheeler if it's engaged into the rack, and it is. And then I'll bring this up a little bit too. Now at this point, the gear right in here is also meshed. Draw those up evenly. If you force it and they're not meshed, you will damage gears. So that works okay, and that works okay, and I'm going to tighten these down real well. Like that. Time for a hot dog. Okay, before I install the lead screw, let's test it out using this temporary setup. There's the cross feed. And now longitudinal feed in both directions. Okay, that checks out all right. I'm going to go ahead and install the regular lead screw. Okay, here we go. And the banjo. Oh, Susanna. And the two screws here. And now the bushing. 
the 80 tooth gear, which they call an idler. I don't know why they call it an idler. And finally, the nut. And the thread chasing dial, or the threading dial. And always keep this disengaged unless you're threading. Less wear on everything. And you're probably only threading 5% of the time at the most. Alright, let's install the cross slide. Surgically clean. I already cleaned the other one. Plenty of Earl. You can always wipe the excess. Make sure that your gibs are in the correct position here. And I have the gib screws backed off a little bit. And now I will adjust the gibs off camera. Just snug them up. I think I've shown that in other videos. And lastly, the compound. Spread the oil, and I like to park it at about 29 degrees. And the reason for that, that's your threading position, but also if you have it straight in, the two interfere with each other and are quite annoying. So that's, this seems to be the standard practice to keep it in that position. So I'll tighten this one and this one. Love those Bondas ball end Allen wrenches, don't you? Hex keys. I'll tell the story again in case you've never heard it. My brother had a set of these about 25 years ago at the junior college. He just loved them, and they were kind of new on the market, I believe, at the time. And uh, at the end of a period, a boy came up and said, Mr. Peterson, his name was Peterson too, I did you a big favor. All of the ends of your Allen keys were buggered up. I ground them off flat for you. Thought you'd like that. And lastly, I think I've said that three times, Let's put the tailstock on. I don't know if I said this earlier in the video, but make sure you unplug your machines or trip the breaker or use the lockout tag out, but let's work safely, shall we? Well, let's have a little oil on the lead screw and on the keyway. And wherever you see a gets oiler, I know it's running over. And I'm going to put quite a bit of oil into this reservoir that I talked about. I'm not going to take the time for you to see that. And so on. Now here's the Genuine South Bend lubrication chart for the 9 and 10 inch lathes. And actually it folds out and could be posted on the wall. And it's telling you all the points of lubrication. So get yourself one of these. It might be online or it probably tells in the South Bend how to run a lathe book. Very important. If you recall, in the last video where I cut the keyway, I wasn't able to cut it any farther than what you see right there because of the table travel. So some of you may have been worried about that, thinking that I would not have full travel. But right now I'm hitting the chuck and I'm really quite a ways from the end of this keyway in regards to that worm with the key in it. Understand what I mean? Okay, let's have a little test run. There's the longitudinal feed. Feed change lever in a position for cross feed. 
And that's what I was really after. And remember, the direction of travel can be reversed by using the feed reverse lever. This lathe runs real quietly, doesn't it? Thanks to John Collins for that. All right, now let's try the threading position. Middle in the feed change position. So we no longer have to use that for longitudinal feed. We use it only for threading. Let me emphasize that. Well, what do you think? I believe it came out pretty well, and I'm very pleased, and thank you to the donors of all this equipment. Remember, you can do this to your lathe if you come up with the right parts and you have $50,000 worth of machine tools. Let me tell you again that these machine tools are capable of reproducing themselves. That's one of the things that's so neat about a machine tool as opposed to a tool like a tractor or something like that that cannot make, or a punch press, can't make another punch press. Thank you very much to these donors and friends for making this video possible. For those of you out there that enjoy this type of content and own South Bend Lays, I have a video course, a series of 50 videos, 50 chapters, that's over 13 hours of running time available for purchase. I actually have sold thousands of these and many people like them, including teachers. If you're interested in this type of thing, and I have other courses also for the Logan and the Atlas and the Bridgeport, watch for my promos that I run from time to time on YouTube. Again, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the content. I have many more videos, 1,400 of them almost on YouTube, so check them out, subscribe. Please give me a thumbs up if you like this type of content. And I'll see you next time. Lots of still pictures to follow, so stick around.